This is Startup to Storefront. Odds are high that over the past year, the word NFT has been entered into your personal vocabulary. Whether you use the word NFT while describing how many you own, or if you use the word pejoratively while describing how you feel about them, NFTs have become mainstream. The Startup Storefront team has been taking a deep dive into that world over the past few months, and as such, we are sharing our findings with you so that you may become better informed. Our guest today is Mike Sapinski, a part of the team behind the Moments in History NFT. This particular NFT community has a goal of uniting both history novices and buffs, reflecting on moments throughout our global history that have shaped our lives today. So listen in as we cover everything from the pros and cons of designing an NFT by committee, how to teach a new audience to use Discord, and how a coma changed his career path. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Mike from Moments in History NFT. Full disclosure, we invested, and so we're into the project. Mike, I just wanted to go back. So we're starting to grow, I guess, our listenership with the NFT community. And so bring us to the beginning. Bring us to what was the time where you were like, all right, well, let's go down this road of creating an NFT. What was the concept? What was the idea? What was like the seed of the idea? So I came onto the team actually a bit after the idea was was born, right? So they had a previous collection that they were going to do, and it's it was actually focused on some weird history with like serial killers was kind of the original idea. That's what the artist's art was going to be. There was a bit of a interest in that, but it was too niche, which, which they found, and that didn't allow the community to grow the way that we wanted it to. And, and then we kind of pulled the community and decided to go in a different direction, um, which are these new 12 historical characters. So just so I'm clear, at the time, you're, so you already had the Discord. Okay, so the Discord is live, and you, go, you guys are like, all right, we might go serial killer route and then a litmus test not working out, and then you pivoted, but same Discord channel, same group of, same, same community. One. Yep, same one, same community. So yeah, we've got some people who, are, who have been with us since that, that original idea was, was around. When was that? Oh gosh, uh, I think the Discord's been alive for almost nine to 12 months now. So okay. it's been hanging around for a bit. Yeah. And then once you guys decide to, I guess on the concept, was it always to bring sort of a metaverse feel? Like, was it always to, was, was the concept in terms of like, let's bring a museum to the metaverse? Was that directionally where you guys always wanted to go? Yeah, I think Eric had a huge passion for wanting to be the first to do something in this space. And he, you know, he did his due diligence on research and didn't find, like, he's a big history buff. So, you know, he's always been interested in museums and, and learning about history and, and culture. And yeah. when he went into his research, he just didn't see anyone doing anything like this. He didn't see anyone putting up a museum. And, and what better marketing opportunity is there to like say, hey, we're going to be the first of something in this space. Like, I don't know if you guys have been in the NFT space for a long time, but the first of anything does quite well, you know, if, if you can be that. So I think yeah. that's that was the idea there. And for people listening, Eric is uh, so he created, I think, Earth Picks and then History Photographed are a couple Instagram accounts that he grew from zero to millions of followers. And so even if people aren't familiar with Moments in History NFT project, they're definitely familiar with a few key Instagram accounts that he built from nothing to a pretty pretty amazing place, which is, which uh, at least when I'm doing my research as someone purchasing or investing or you know trying to learn more about a project, having someone who's familiar in the social media game is pretty helpful because at the end of the day, that's where a lot of people find out about these projects, whether it's Twitter, or Instagram, and then from there, the, you know, the funnel goes. Let me let me join the Discord and see what's up. Yeah, having that audience is key. Yeah, I think the cool thing that we have with Eric's social media gathering that he's been able to acquire over his his career is that they believe in him and like almost blindly, and you know that's very rare to find in the NFT space because everyone just is looking for the next quick flip. So. You know, we've just had our snapshot of people who minted and held for the first month. And I was anticipating like, you know, a thousand wallets who minted and are still holding their NFTs. And it was actually 2,500 and, and almost over half of our collection was still people who minted and, and are holding on to their NFTs. And that put my mind at ease knowing that Great. impatience is something that's very common in this space and people are being patient and letting us grow and do our work which is really cool so let's talk about this so the mid date comes and then 
there's a there's a bit of an issue right on the back end and so they mint they get revealed and again this is just so people who are trying to maybe get into the space and by the way there hasn't been a single project that i've invested in where mint day has gone flawlessly so i think also if you're not in the nft game and you're interested in joining please be aware that reveal day or minting day will have problems and i would call that normal and don't freak out for this one, it's funny. So I, I went from having a Cleopatra during the reveal to then it moving to an Alexander the Great. And my wife was like, oh, I got a Cleopatra. And then it turns out it wasn't. And then I had to go buy a Cleopatra for her because she was so hyped. So that's how I ended up with three. What are some of the technical details that happen behind the scenes that most people don't know about? So what ended up happening was that there was a glitch mainly with, it was the Cleopatra character that uh, ended up having most of the double ups. And from a layering perspective, the art, so there was, you know, a, a bunch of them got minted and then to check 8,888 different renderings of the NFTs is not the easiest thing to filter from a tech perspective. We ran two or three trial runs and reviewed them and, and they seemed to be okay. We didn't see duplicate issues. But, you know, that could have just been human error, you know, reviewing them and, and making sure that that dupes didn't happen is, is a difficult thing to do on that large of a scale. We used a scraping tool as well. Um, the tech team did to try to mitigate any type of duplication concerns. Um, but there was just there was just an error with the Cleopatra character and one of the traits that kind of sent things down the wrong direction and created duplicates down down that character. And that's why we saw a lot of the people who had Cleopatras ended up refreshing their metadata and didn't have Cleopatras anymore. And I've actually taken upon myself to go into OpenSea and I've reviewed every single character and made sure that all of them are now accurate and refreshed appropriately because we've had a lot of people who invested and, and haven't checked again. You know, they bought their one NFT, kept it in their wallet and haven't done anything with it. So I'd, I wanted to make sure that when they come back, it's it's the one that they wanted and and if it's not, then they can do something about it. Yeah, so just like diving more into the metaverse, I, I know a lot of people are starting to get parcels of land. Like one person is getting into Decentraland and another project is getting into uh, Sandbox. So why did you specifically choose Sandbox for that route? So I've kind of been the lead in the metaverse journey um, just because I'm a nerd and I think it's awesome. <laughs> and uh, so I did my own research and I've gotten to know a few people just through some lucky breaks that I've had throughout my NFT investing career. And I was found a bit disheartened by Decentraland's flexibility within what we can do within their metaverse. Um, most of the land is pretty well sold and owned by large groups of people, or um, it's being a bit more controlled than Sandbox, and Sandbox has a lot more open space. So we wanted to have a place where we can buy our property, be as flexible as we want, because Eric, you know, shoots for the stars, and if he's told that he can't do something, that's not going to be okay. And we, we ended up having a really great connection with a, a lead ambassador for Sandbox, and they've they've connected us with Land Vault, which is the number one builder on that platform by almost like, I think they've created like 10 times more property than the next closest builders. So I think the stars just aligned for Sandbox to be kind of that first direction that we go to. And and then I think the important thing to think about with the metaverse too, is it's like, it's its own brand. Like just because we're just in Sandbox right now, doesn't mean we can't go here and can't go there and can't go, you know, explore further options moving forward. As a real estate developer in real life, does the metaverse, like when you say you you're using Land Vault and you know one of the best builders in the game, do they give you like a series of options? Like, is there like you hire an architect and there's almost like a front end developer? Is that is it is it basically a front end and then you're looking at different options, different layouts, and then you just decide on one? How does how does like literally the building of that work? So our last meeting with Land Vault, they told us that well they have 26 people on their team that do different things throughout the building process. And and for the most part, the engineers and the architects will, will kind of come to us with a coming up of a plan of what we want this thing to look like. And then, so so there's that group that just kind of sets the structure up of what how big everything is going to be and what the size and the scope is. And then once we get down into the detail, they have a group of people who do customizable type builds, which 
kind of costs a bit more, but we think we need to do that to get it done right. So it's almost like a three-step process. We need to understand how much land is going to cost, and then we need to understand how much the building itself is going to cost, and then we need to figure out how much we want to customize from there. And and it's all different people from gaming, gaming developers, architectural people from real life who do physical type work have moved into the metaverse space. And I can't, I, it's hard for me to even wrap my head around all the work that goes on behind the scenes, to be honest. And then like, so, so then the obvious question is how do you decide, right? So do you let this go to the community vote or, or like if people hate the museum, are they like, God damn it, Mike. And if they love it or like, Oh, Mike, you get all the credit. Like, what is that? Right. Cause it's almost like you don't want to give as a developer myself, we'll hear input, but I'm going to make the decision. Right. And so I would imagine you just have to make the decision because that by committee is way too hard. I think some of the decisions that we, we have to make by ourselves is like the size, like how big we want this thing to be. We want it to be like multiple floors and figuring out which floor will have specific things being shown and displayed. But I think the thing that the community can maybe help us with is like, um, you know, specific things like, should we make this available to everyone within the first month or should we have it exclusive for just our holders for the first month? Or do we want to have our NFT displayed on the first floor or the third floor? You know, something like that where they can feel like they're part of the process. But I think as us being the development team, we're probably going to take the lead and and take the advice a lot from from who we're going to be working with as well and making this thing look cool because that's what they're best at. I know you do a really good job engaging the community with with AMAs on Twitter or Spaces, and then obviously all over Discord, you crush. I mean, I think what when people ask me about NFTs, like literally this happens pretty often, and they're like, I can just take pictures of myself and put them on OpenSea. And I'm like, yeah, you can do that if you want to waste your time. And I think a big thing is like how people build community. And I think this becomes sort of the X factor with all projects. What have been some se- some challenges that because you guys are you're tackling a big monster right it's like literally moments in history and here you are bringing history into the future and you sound like an alien just came down from 2080 and so when it comes to your perspective what is it like managing this community in particular and what are the challenges or surprises that you've you've personally dealt with there's been a few projects that i've worked with and attempted to get up off the ground and this project specifically has a challenge in that the large audience is Instagram focused and a large audience is their This is their first NFTs and most of them have never engaged with discord before. So getting them to answering the simple questions that I thought were obvious, I guess is probably the thing that kind of, I found a bit difficult at first because, you know, most people didn't even know how to, you know, change their avatar on Discord or update their username or, you know, make sure to verify appropriately so that they can have access to all the channels. Like a lot of people were joining our Discord and then thinking that it was broken because they didn't know that they had to click the verify button and just things like that to get the, the project up and running. But I also think getting us marketing across all of our social media platforms and getting people onto Discord has been a significant challenge too. Like, they bought the NFT because they believe in Eric. They didn't buy the NFT because they believe in NFTs. So they don't feel like they need to adapt into that world, really. They're just going to tuck it away in their wallet and see if it's worth, you know, a lot of money in a few years. And so we're still almost proving it to them as well, that this space is much larger than us and that it's, you know, worthwhile investments and things like that. So that's probably my biggest challenge. That and like, I'm a people pleaser. Like, I don't like it when one person's unhappy with me. So (laughs) being okay with people being unhappy with me is a new skill that I'm constantly trying to work on. Do you by chance know the demographics of your, like the community? So is this stemming from like just people being older or is it stemming from like, this is their first NFT project? So uh, that's a really good question. The most that we have from a demographic standpoint is that Eric mentioned that the majority of his social media followers are between the ages of 25 and 34. And we've also found out that I think it was, I don't want to misquote him, but I'm pretty sure it was really close to this number about 65 to 70% of the followers are female and 35 to 30 are male, which is like the exact opposite of the NFT space, which I find really cool and really positive and something that Eric's really passionate about too. So that's the demographics. I think from our, our NFT holders demographics, we haven't, we're, we're planning on sending out a Google doc to get some more information on this, but 
I would probably say that the people who have adopted into the Discord aren't of the older generation, but I could see a lot of people who follow him on Instagram could be of that older generation as well. So I think more research definitely needs to be done for us from a marketing perspective there. I was going to ask about that as well because I do the social media for the podcast just in case anybody didn't know that. But yeah, one of the things you could do is even run a poll on Twitter. I didn't know if Twitter was used a lot for moments in history as well. It sounds like Instagram, like you said, which makes sense with your demographic. So you could definitely run a poll or something like that just to kind of gain a census of what people's age is and things like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. My focus has been trying to grow our Twitter platform a little bit. Like that's why I've been hosting spaces. Um, I'm going to be hosting a couple of guest speakers on Twitter spaces moving forward to just try to get people's eye on us in that space because we all know that's where the big money is and NFTs is is on Twitter, unfortunately. Well, not unfortunately, but it just is what it is. So we're like kind of like this sleeping project that no one has heard of yet, but I feel as soon as we start to get some big names following us, we're we're excited to see what that can do to our value of our NFTs at least. And I know, I mean, you guys are doing an amazing giveaway where you're doing two like blue chip NFTs, which is pretty crazy. And so I wanted to ask you, how do you think about like the giveaways? Because they're kind of like pros and cons, right? Like there are some groups that just do giveaways every week and that's cool. The community loves them. But at the same time, like it sort of does detract from the bigger picture. But, you know, you give the people what they want. So it's kind of nice. But how do you like, because you strike me as more of like, I want to build an honest community and I want everyone here for the marathon. And so a giveaway kind of takes away from that. Like, what's the strategy in terms of giveaways on how you how you look at it? So as far as the the big royalties giveaway, that was something that Eric was really passionate about and he wanted to give back to holders. And and I don't think we ever thought that we'd have 80 ETH to spend <laughs> on this first giveaway. Like our success was we, we thought we would be like successful and sell out and everything, but we didn't think that we'd have 800 ETH of secondary sales in that first month. So this first giveaway has turned into like this amazing opportunity to change a couple people's lives with some blue chip NFTs and get some, you know, physical things into people's homes as a reminder of our project and things and just make them feel a bit more attached. And then as far as my thoughts on giveaways in the Discord is if I feel that the Discord community needs a little bit of a spark or something to be excited about, I'll I'll pump out a giveaway. And, and that's pretty much just a feel thing. Like, I think luckily for us right now, our, our NFTs are at a, a price that are affordable. So giving them away is, is an easy way for us to just kind of give them a, a thank you for believing in us. And, you know, I try to do one or two a month. I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy and go all over Twitter and give away one to every you know influencer but i'll i'll thank the community within our discord and give them some every now and then specifically if they they've like leveled up in the discord or or our holders or something like that it seems logical yeah. to me i'll say this much from my perspective because i'm in so many discords it's it could be like a full-time job you know just like hanging out so from your perspective is this a full-time job for you or are you working on a series of things like what is it like from your perspective, where you're literally charged with sparking the community all the time. I actually quit my IRL job and uh, I'm d doing this full time now. So this is a full time job for me. Um, I'm not just a uh, Discord community manager. I also am the head of partnerships and, and focus on the metaverse stuff as well. But the Discord is probably 70% of my work. And it, it takes that much, I think, to keep things going. Sure. And yeah, so it's full time and it's a, a thrilling thing and it's a it's a twenty four seven thing. Like you just need to always be switched on and ready for something to happen and it's exciting and and exhausting all in the best sort of ways. Yeah, can, can you tell us about that moment though that when you quit because that's that's a big leap. You know, you're going especially in this day and age. It's still on the cutting edge. So I mean, what was your thoughts about like? jumping headfirst into something like this uh, full time? Was it something that you just knew that you had to do because of the time required? Was it because you you just felt the pull of everything like leading in that direction? And what was what was the thoughts of everyone around you? So my decision is, is quite a deep one. Um, I had a, a health scare actually about 12 months ago, that landed me I was in a coma for like four or five days. And Ever since then, I've kind of, uh, prior to this career change, I've done the same thing for about 12 years. But after I came out of that health scare and, you know, fully recovered and everything, I kind of decided that I wanted to do something that made me, 
you know, genuinely happy and excited me and, and was that I was passionate about. And I was into NFTs for quite some time, even before I got sick. So that was the one thing that I was up all night doing, you know, like looking at NFTs, minting at three in the morning because I live in Australia and like, you know, doing whatever it takes to try to make it happen. And, you know, while I was working my regular job, I was thinking about NFTs. So I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, um, I decided, you know, I, I, I worked on a few projects before this, hoping that I could make the change. But then this one ended up being the one that, you know, I felt most secure with and safe with and assured that it's going to, you know, be something that's going to be around for a period of time. And, you know, I had the support of my amazing wife. She was very happy for me to make the change. And uh, my daughter likes the pictures. So that was like a plus, right? <laughs> so I just, everything just kind of felt right. And I thought to myself, I'd regret it if I didn't at least try. And uh, luckily for me as well, my other job uh, is a security blanket. You know, if I need to ever go back, there's not going to be an issue there as well. So I just had a lot of things to support that decision. Was it like a car accident or what, what led you to be in a coma? Yeah, oh, it's a long story, but I went to bed one night and I woke up the next morning and I couldn't feel the entire right side of my body. I couldn't talk. I didn't know who my wife was, who my daughter was. And um, it ended up being an autoimmune viral infection within my brain and my brainstem. And uh, it took them a solid month or two to figure out that diagnosis. They thought it was a stroke at first, um, then a possible brain tumor. And then they ruled both of them out, thank goodness. And then they just didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, it's a pretty rare thing that happened to me. And it typically actually happens in females. So that's why they didn't pick up on it right away. But I think it was like one out of 100 thousand males get it and i was just one of them unfortunately that's crazy i don't even know how do they how do they is it surgery like what do they begin to so like what are the things that they get to get the brain flowing again it was a mixture of antibiotics and then just kind of flushing out my it's ivif it's called it was like seven thousand dollars a day worth of medication that would just flush my body out to kind of reset my immune system and once they figured it out five or six days of that and i was good to go is this something that you have to worry about ever relapsing or is this like a remission period like that that's just kind of permanent at this point? Yeah, no, it's it's something that was just absolutely a freak accident and or freak, not an accident, a freak thing that happened. And it's it's I'm not likely to ever have it happen to me again. I know we're getting personal, but like at least on our podcast, we have listeners that are like afraid to take that first step in entrepreneurship. And so for you what was the moment for you? Was it when you were in the hospital bed and you're like, everything's changing or, or did you have to gradually come to the realization of like, everything was different and I'm in control now? Like, what was that moment like? So physically I'm perfectly fine. Like I, I, I healed relatively quickly, luckily, cause I'm, I'm younger and, you know, I try to keep in shape and all that stuff, but my mental health was, was struggling for quite some time after it. And, uh, it took a gradual process because my brain, like I was like, okay, I'm healthy. I'm just going to jump right back into work. And I did that way too quick. So I jumped back into my job, but like the back of my head was like, you're not enjoying yourself. You know, you're not here passionately working hard. You're not, you know, your, your whole heart isn't into it. And I was constantly asking myself, like, why am I doing this? And I never used to ask that before. And I would say it took probably two or three months before I decided I need to actually take, I took vacation time. So I, I jumped right off of being sick. I got out of the hospital and like two weeks later I was working full time. And then I just ran myself down mentally and physically again. And then I took two weeks off. And then during that two weeks off is when everything kind of hit me. I was like, I'm very, very happy. Like, cause that's all I did during my two weeks off was NFT stuff, right? And like enjoying time with my family and, and working from home doing some side projects for some NFT community members. And I was like, I'm, I'm really happy here. This is, these are where my priorities are now. And, uh, I think that I can, I can be successful in this. So I ended up going back to work and, you know, putting a plan together on just giving it my all and my free time outside of my regular job. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was that time off that I took from my, my real job that, yeah. um, allowed me to get that space and, and ability to overcome that mental health stuff. I appreciate you sharing that. On a lighter note, tell me what it's like to tell your parents that you're moving into the metaverse and NFT land and what on earth are they thinking? Well, first I told my parents 
and my mom's like, well, what's Discord? <laughs> and so I, she didn't even know how to download the app to her, her phone. So I was like, well, here it is. So she's in our community. She, she keeps an eye on what we're doing and, and checks things out. Um, she doesn't have a clue what NFTs are, but she just thinks it's cool that my name's in yellow in the Discord. And <laughs> she's supporting you. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. So and then I had to tell my grandparents that was a no-go. I just said, I'm doing a different job now, Grandma, so... It's all good. <laughs> yeah. I did have a question, actually. You talked about your daughter. So a lot of people are actually gifting NFTs to their kids. Is that something that you're kind of exploring and uh, wanting to get into later on? Like, what are your thoughts behind that? Like, if someone did that with one of your NFTs? Yeah, so there was probably a period of time where I was, like, minting new stuff a lot. Like, when I didn't have these other responsibilities, I was constantly minting NFTs, buying NFTs, and... Every Sunday morning, I have like my daughter, father time, and I would show her the NFTs I bought that week. And she would usually come to me after a while and say, what, what pictures do you have today? And I said, they're not pictures, they're NFTs. And then I realized I was arguing with a three-year-old. So, um, But no, she'd pick which one she liked, and then I, I would, um, yeah, I'm keeping them, and, and she can look at them whenever she wants to. And and some of them are worth some money and some of them aren't worth any money, but as long as she likes them, that's kind of my game plan at the at the moment. Um, my focus is just continuing to build my own portfolio so I can do other things for her in the future rather than just own some NFTs. Can you share with us just a couple of your favorite projects that you really like at the moment? My favorite project of all time since I've been in the NFT space is OnChain Monkey. Um, outside of Moments in History, of course. They are fully docs team that are very charitable and conscientious of, um, you know, environmental concerns and things like that. They were a random free mint in the middle of the night. And a friend of mine in the NFT space said, well, I'm going to mint like 50 of these because he's a whale and was like just minting everything and gas didn't mean anything to him. And so I minted five. And ever since then, they've, I've been kind of watching how they handle their Discord community and how they've been growing and just proving that they're meeting all their goals. Their floor right now is all the way from a free mint is at like 1.7 ETH. Um, I just sold one of theirs for 9 ETH a couple of days ago from a free mint. Nice. So I respect them because they had so much confidence in themselves that they just chucked their NFT out on a free mint basis and have just been working so hard ever since then. And so I've got a lot of respect for them. I know one thing that's that's like changing the landscape right now is like obviously Solana has their own NFT network, Cardano, CNFTs. And so, you know, for people that are today, and this is just this is just free advice to anyone who's listening and thinking about an NFT project, how do you view that? Like, cause it makes it difficult, right? So on one hand you have lower gas fees, but on the other hand, there's not many people in that world just yet. And so when you think about making that decision on where to mint, or where to set up your project, you know, what, what are some of the things that you look for or do you go, you know, these all, all these things are going to grow rapidly. And so it's kind of just pick one and move forward. Actually, I'm not, I, I, not due to the fact that I don't believe in the other platforms, but I've just really been ETH focused. I, I've probably minted a couple Solana projects and they didn't end up doing much for me. And then that was probably because I didn't do my full research and stuff like that. But you know, there's no doubt that there's good projects on every platform, but I just don't, I don't feel as confident in the sustainability of, of all of them as I do with like the Ethereum platform. Just seeing Ethereum as the secondary cryptocurrency under Bitcoin is about as far as I'd like to go from a comfort level of investing my own money and stuff like that. Um, I, I totally support all platforms and whatever works for anyone is great. And I love the free gas. Like that was sweet. I was really happy to mint and mint the projects I did and not pay gas. So as we wrap, what well, can you tell us about what's on the roadmap for moments in history? Yeah, man, really, really excited about some announcements that we're going to have with this partnership with land vault that we're going to land here. Um, there's an opportunity for a multifaceted approach within sandbox and a building perspective. Um, we've gotten, lucky to reach out to the right type of people and, and they're providing us with a bit of a significant offer that um, they're not offering a lot of other projects because they love what we're doing and think that we are you know different and that's what they're looking for so that's really cool i'm really excited about the charitable 
um, collections that we have coming up. Eric is a good friend of Tom from MySpace. So they're going to be doing an NFT collection drop that's going to be 100% for a charity that I am unsure of what they've picked at this point. Um, and the NFT is going to just be, you know, the, the famous picture of Tom. Um, yeah. So that's going to, you know, probably be the, the NFT collection picture there. And uh, I think they're going to do, I, I can't remember what the mint count on that one was, but it's going to be a significant size and then all the money is just going to go straight to charity. And then um, Eric has been able to foster a friendship with the president of El Salvador, um, President Bukel. So they've been able to agree to a charitable NFT for El Salvador that displays their history, their culture, and how they got from where they first started to being this like ambassador for cryptocurrency used by a government and things like that. So one thing I want to ask you about is like the floor. So leading up to the drop, like how did you handle all the haters saying this project was going to be worth this? And then like after the mint, like how do you handle all the criticism of like, oh, the floor is dropping or there's no confidence in the project? Like how do you respond to that? Especially now that you have like, you're all in, you got skin in the game and you quit your job and you're all in. So I, I have like this really weird experience with that because as an investor, like selfishly, I do look at the floor. Like I'm not going to sit here and act like if I have invested into a project, I'm not looking at the floor price, right? right? So I'm trying to balance this like understanding of like working on a team and then handling investors' experience and, and overall happiness with how their investment's going. And from studying on-chain monkey, I think uh, that's why they're my favorite project is where I've learned the most is you have to let people just kind of vent and if they're unhappy, then then that's that is what it is. And and if they want to sell, like I'm totally fine with that. Like that's great. Like go ahead and sell. Maybe someone else will come in who isn't so concerned about that floor price and will stick around long term. In the meantime, I'm just going to keep working and keep delivering. And those who are happy with what the price that they got their NFT at and happy with that progress will stick around with us. Um, I I don't think there's really anything else you can really do because if you get caught up in all of that. You're going to do something like, you know, artificially try and bump that floor price up. And I just don't believe in that. Like, that just doesn't seem right on brand with what we're trying to accomplish here. Like, we could have swept the floor like five times, right? And we could have a 0.5 ETH floor and then give away all those NFTs. But that's going to bump out a lot of people. And I think it would upset a lot of people who maybe got in early, right? And and then they see, you know, they got their 0.07 mint. They see it go to 0.14, and then they sell and then we sweep the floor up to 0.5 and then they can't get back in, right? Like I kind of like that gradual, you know, growth and then dips every now and then for those people who want to get back in and stuff like that. Not just like this meteorical rise where everything goes up to three ETH floor and then it drops back down to one and everyone's lost even more money. So I think if you get caught up in that, that, that can be so bad for you as a project. Yeah, nothing great is built overnight. And like, there's always the people with paper hands or people just quick flippers trying to make an extra buck. So I agree with you. It's crazy to think like it's only been five weeks since our public mid date. I feel like I've had to handle like some serious expectations from from some community members. And I'm like, man, we're only five weeks in. Like if this was a startup business, like we'd still be hiring people. (laughs) Like we'd still be like trying to figure out what the next step is after making like, you know, almost two million dollars on mint today right like let us figure out you know just take a deep breath nft world like everything's going to be okay (laughs) mike listen where can everyone find the project twitter it sounds like we have to grow the twitter we do we do we're at um at history in nfts on twitter and we're on moments in history.io website and then we're obviously in um I think we got moments in history on Instagram, but couldn't get it on Twitter. Yeah. So it's moments in, at moments in history on, on Instagram. Yeah. Our Discord yeah. links in the Twitter and the Instagram bios. So please come in and hang out with me and, and uh, don't talk about the floor too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Right I appreciate on. you joining Thank the podcast. You. Pleasure man. having you on, Mike. No, no, it was really good. And uh, I, I, lo- I listened to probably four or five of your guys' podcasts on my flight from Australia over to here. And, and love the vibes that you guys have. And uh, I hope you guys keep getting some awesome guests on and uh, can grow yourselves in this NFT space. This was part of our continuing series exploring NFTs. We've got a few more that we'll be sprinkling into our schedule from time to time. 
I think it's safe to assume that if you made it this far, you've enjoyed the show. So consider subscribing if you're not already. Or better yet, leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are at Startup Storefront on every social media platform except for Twitter, where you can find us at STS Podcast LA. The Startup Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capolini, Lexi Jamison, Owen Capolini, and me, Nick Conrad. Music by Double Touch. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you next time.